we are sitting down at the ILMEA conference. I've got Mr. Scott Barnes here, and we're lucky enough today to uh, interview Professor James F. Keene. Professor Keene, how are you today? Just fine. I just finished the dress rehearsal for the All-State Honors Band, and uh, it's been a great couple of days with the kids. Great. How's the band sounding? Well, you'll have to decide that when you hear them this <laughs> afternoon. I'm very proud of them. I think they sound, I, th- I think they sound really good. There's some wonderful right, players right. in there, and some even better people. Well, let's kind of go right into that. So, um, we have heard from many people that regard you as, as a, a fantastic rehearsal uh, technician. Um, when you stand in front of a band, let's say you stand in front of the the All State Honors Band. Um, what is something that you are immediately looking for? Well, immediately I want a cohesive sound. Uh, I spend perhaps a little more time with that initial warm-up process and trying to, to, to get a concept of sound with the groups and understanding that sound is first, and that's what it's all about. And uh, so we take a little bit more time initially. The first rehearsal begins a little bit slowly and try and get as much eye contact as possible, try and get as much engagement as possible so that they understand uh, basically uh, basically the best way that I can put it is is I want to, to make uh, that first rehearsal and I want to make that warm up kind of uh, set the tone for all the rehearsals, how we rehearse, the intensity, lots of contact, moving around, moving around during that warm up, but in the process, warming up a lot of things, warming up the brain, the ear, the process, the engagement, the eye contact, and understanding that sound comes first. Okay. And so that's what we're trying to do initially in that first mm-hmm. rehearsal. So when it comes to the programming for it, because we, we also have talked to a couple of your colleagues who have said that um, your your programming is just, just top notch, and, and we've also heard you've been a great supporter of a lot of your alums, and you will help them out with programming. What is your approach to programming for an honor band today? And then maybe if we could ask what your approach would be when you were programming for um, University of Illinois. Um, well, well, the approach for an honor band... Uh, well, one of the things I want to know is obviously I want to know how big the band's going to be because that, uh, obviously I need a maturity level. I want, you want to challenge the students and especially a band like this, which is a sight reading band. You want to challenge them, but, uh, you want to set them up, uh, you, you know, you want to set them up for success and you want to present them with music that's of quality. Uh, you're setting them up for success. You're setting them up with music of quality. Music of quality has to come first. But you have to take a lot of things into consideration. Uh, a student doesn't audition to come to an honor band to sit there while other sections are being there. And quite often that's the case with percussion. Mm-hmm. And, and many of the great pieces and many of the wonderful band standards uh, have minimal percussion. So you need to find, I try and find a couple of pieces that will feature the percussion or at least that will keep the percussionist busy. I think they understand that, that they're just going to be playing basic battery when they come doing the march and when they're doing some traditional music and, uh, perhaps some transcriptions or arrangements from the early 20th century or the 19th century or earlier, um, that the percussion is going to be quite basic. So you want, you want to, to get them involved too in all of those things. Because there is, for instance, in, in, uh, the Illinois uh, All State Honor Band, because it's such a huge band, almost 160 players, uh, you can't, you, 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 understandably, you're, you're going to have some spots that require transparency, and that's going to be very, very difficult. Mm-hmm. But you do the best you can with that. But you try and do things that, that keep all of the, uh, that, that challenge all of the sections, that feature all of the sections, that allow all of the sections while being challenged to, uh, experience success. Uh, really a minimal number of solos. 
And when there are those sections that you would normally do one on a part or something, kids didn't come to have, they didn't show up to have their in- instruments in their laps. Mm-hmm. So I may have multiple soloists or where it says one player or something like that. Uh, I may go ahead and add the players or have the entire first section playing or something. Uh, and it's my job to balance it and to, to see to it that they blend and that, that, that they sound like one. I heard somebody say one time that a, that a good program is like with, with this old saying that they used to have. There was a, there was, there was, uh, uh, there was a band, uh, a dance band back in the thirties or forties. I don't remember who it was that used to say something old, something new, something borrowed and something blue, <laughs> which mm-hmm. supposedly is kind of an old wedding tradition or whatever. But I think in some ways you do that when you're programming for honor mm-hmm. bands. Uh, in my case, since I spent uh, several years at the University of Illinois, and I was blessed to be with the John Philip Sousa Library mm-hmm. and to have access to that, to that, to have access to the Sousa books, the Sousa Band markings, the traditions of the Sousa Band. I, I feel like it's almost a responsibility to me to go out and play a Sousa march. Okay. So I'll then generally do a Sousa march. I want an opener that will get the kids off, that will have a lot of tutti playing, that will be exciting, that will get the kids off to a good start, that will get them playing tutti, get their confidence, get them playing well, and that will get the audience involved in the program. Mm. I want some expression in the program. I always have some expressive music and an expressive piece in the program. And I want a piece where they're not going to be worrying about technique, where we can teach expressive concepts within that, where we can teach blend, balance, and fusion within that. And as I said before, challenging all sections. In this case, for instance, uh, in the uh, in the program that we're doing here with the Illinois uh, All-State Honor Band, we're beginning with Cityscape by Scott Borma, which was written for the Illinois Wind Symphony and for a performance to open a performance in Carnegie Hall. Scott Borma uh, was not an Illinois grad, but uh, but he was bright enough to marry an Illinois grad, <laughs> one, one of our one of our finest graduates, and and just a, a wonderful arranger, writer, composer, and he especially does uh, the fanfare type. Uh, music very very well and so he, he did us a wonderful fanfare called cityscape and it's challenging it's exciting it has lots of percussion interest it has uh, a lot of challenging parts for everybody it's a bright sound and it's a great way to open the pro- uh, the program uh, I wanted something where where we can do some music teaching for instance we are doing the Chacon second from the Holst E-flat suite. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was tempted to do the entire suite, but when I started looking at the length of the program I had chosen, we would be going over time. But I was able to do that, for, first of all, for its historic nature. And from a teaching standpoint, I was I was able to, to do some teaching with the band to, to, to tell them about Gustav Holst, how important he was in the band movement, how important he was in the music world and what a versatile musician he was, but also to teach them uh, form in terms of the, the Chacon, using the ground-based thematic material and adding the variations. And in rehearsal, I showed them where each variation occurred, and in the rehearsal process, Rather than giving them measure numbers, uh, after the first rehearsal, we were able to say, go to vari- variation two, go to variation seven, so that there was always that awareness that it was a variation and that there was the thematic mm. material. And, uh, so, and, and also because I feel like sometimes the, uh, the, uh, the whole says misinterpreted. So I had a little message there that I wanted to do with that piece. Then, of course, as I said before, uh, I, I wanted to do a Sousa march, and so we chose the Invincible Eagle. The Invincible Eagle, I think, is Sousa's best 6 8 march, and was, or at least the, his best 6 8 march trio, and was said by my many of the ex Sousa band members that uh, that they thought it was his favorite 6-8 uh, march, although he was claimed to, to, to call a number of his marches his favorites. <laughs> so, I mean, who knows? When people ask me, hey, what's your favorite piece of music? Uh, I like to say, whatever's on my stand right now. 
because I think you have to treat it that way. In any case, so uh, we're doing that. We're we're doing a piece by Howard Hansen Laude. It's a piece that that is somewhat obscure, and it's gone in and out of print. And it's Laude, and it's, and it's uh, chorale variations and metamorphosis. Again, a set of variations, but a very interesting piece by Howard Hansen, who was very very important in American music uh, as as director and and uh, the man who basically built the Eastman School of Music, the man who was so important for his old recordings on Mer- Mercury, championing new music and uh, helping Fred Fennell start the Eastman Wind Ensemble and putting the Eastman Wind Ensemble on record. And Howard Hansen was also a wonderful composer. And this is a piece that... Uh, uh, that people, it's, they come up to me and say, where did you get that? Where did you get What is that piece? Well, it's a piece that's 50 years old, hmm. and that somehow is somewhat obscure, and it's got a lot of modern compositional techniques. Again, the percussion have very, very interesting parts. Every, every, uh, uh, every section in the ensemble is represented, and, uh, and I was fortunate enough... Uh, but I don't know if I mentioned that Howard Hansen was also a very important figure in the National Music Camp, the orchestra part of, of the National Music Camp at Interlock. And so I was fortunate enough to get some edits that were not in the original score in part that Hansen used when he, when he guested at Interlock. And then we're doing a, uh, we put together a two, uh, two movement Shostakovich set. Uh, and and I'm I'm just simply calling it um, uh, I'm just simply calling it uh, remembrance and celebration, and it's uh, it's a little arrangement that was yeah, it's it's kind of kind of got my name on it. I rather call myself an editor because really it was done by a couple of graduate students that sort of put this together, kind of in band form, and it's a very brief uh, uh, prelude that Shostakovich did when he was coming through the city of Novorossiysk, which had been leveled by the Nazis when they were taking over the Eastern Front. And uh, uh, they they were so, the, the town was so brave, they they held up the German troops so that the uh, uh, the Allies could, could fortify Stalingrad. And uh, so there's a shrine there that plays a little chimes theme. And... And uh, Shostakovich did that, and we turned this into a nice little prelude. And so uh, we have this chimes prelude, and uh, the second movement is folk festival from uh, that was done from, which is a compilation of of tunes. And Shostakovich even stole a little bit from his himself and festive overture from it. But it's uh, it's a fun play uh, uh, piece, and it's a great way to end the program. And to finish up the program with a little bit of flair and a little bit of excitement. And I think I might have closed the program with that piece, perhaps, maybe, maybe not, uh, when I did the All State Honors Band for the first time in 1986. So anyway, we're doing that and it's a fun way to end the program. That's why the programming was done as it is. Okay. My programming with the Illinois Band, I tried to I tried to play, I always tried to play something that was new in the program. I wanted a couple of things with, with regard to the program itself. I wanted a piece that, that was a quality, relatively new composition that we would introduce to, to that audience. And so we tried to do that. We did the same kind of, uh, kind of principles in terms of, in terms of balancing a program. Uh, we would do something traditional. I had a, I had a, what I called my, my core repertoire. And that is, it would be pieces like, for instance, the Hindemith Symphony, the Holst Suites, the Persichetti Symphony, uh, the, the, uh, Music for Prague 1968, Lincolnshire Posey, pieces that if a student is at Illinois for four years, they should experience this music because it would be tragic uh, if they didn't and so that would be included in the repertoire so personal question then for for me my ensemble at Joliet my top ensemble is about 75 players and we have um, 
you know, lots of reasons for that with the school. Some of it's a little traditional. Some of it's just our, our student attendance during the day, things like that. So the hardest job I, I keep having is selecting appropriate music for that ensemble. And I was told by a few people that to never play wind ensemble literature with that 75 person group because it wouldn't translate well. Um, and then I've also had some instances where we've, you know, been encouraged to adapt some music to fit that ensemble. So what is your opinion on that? Should we continue looking for the perfect piece for our ensemble if it exists or is it okay to do a little adaptation of a piece. Maybe you don't have a specific instrument in that ensemble or that student moves away all of a sudden. You know, are we okay revoicing parts? Uh, I'm taking that especially from my, my high school band director. Like, I'll look at scores with notes in them that would say, we don't have an English horn, we're rewriting this for a soprano sax at this point. You know, and I've always just wonder, I'm, you know, and, and, and I love him, but I'm like, do we ever get to a point where we're we're negating the composer's intentions doing that? Well, first of all, when you say you have a kid moving out, I, I, I find it an interesting anomal, anomaly that good kids never move in. They always just move out. <laughs> I don't understand how that can happen. Uh -huh. <laughs> in any case, though, um, yeah, I think it's a shame to deprive students of a wonderful musical experience because maybe you're missing that one instrument sure. or other or other. If you're doing it where you're, ch where you're completely changing the composer's intent, completely changing the music, and, and basically, uh, y you know, watering down mm -hmm. the piece, then I think it's really too bad to do that. I think as long as you do something where you, uh, where you maintain the composer's intent, that's just fine. Now, if you've got a choice between two pieces and one fits the ensemble and one doesn't, mm. uh, I don't quite understand why somebody just says, well, I like this piece, so I want to do it. There was a situation I remember one time where I went into the, uh, I went into the rehearsal and I did a clinic with a former student and he, uh, he was new in the position and they were playing a piece of music that they had no business playing. And, uh, I mean, it was just ridiculous. And, and he was a, a new teacher. So, I mean, he's had a cornucopia of potential repertoire. And I said, I said, why are you doing this piece? It's really, really hard. It's got such a tremendously important, uh, bassoon part. The horns are tremendously important. You only have two French horns, and why are you doing this? And the answer was, oh, I just had to do it. It's a piece I've always wanted to conduct. I've, all, I've wanted to conduct it since I, since I was a freshman in college. Well, that's fine, but there is no I in band. Mm -hmm. There is no I in ensemble. There is no I in orchestra. You know, so, uh, I, I mean... It's, it's a matter of common sense mm -hmm. on what works and what doesn't. But certainly in, in, in terms of many cases, you, you can adapt and you can edit. And I, and I do it all the time, particularly, however, with transcriptions. Okay. Because tr what is a transcription? Uh, I remember uh, we, we were doing uh, the School of Music had somebody that was hired that time to do program notes for something that we did uh, uh normally they uh, i made sure after that that we did all of all of our own program notes and it was somebody that was new and and who i think they 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 hired they got some money to do it i i I've, i don't know how it was but it was somebody who was a really really good writer and so we sent in the program and we said t-r-a-n-s period transcribed by mark hinesley mm -hmm. and when the programs came, I, I guess this was a person that didn't like abbreviations. So the program notes said, translated by Mark Hinesley. This is a person who had done a lot of theater, you know, and where you're doing librettos <laughs> right. in, in different languages. And I kind of laughed. I thought, oh, this is funny. But then I thought about it and I thought, you know, really, that's what, this, what a transcription is. It's a translation. You're translating the composer's intent. You're translating the string and orchestral material to the language 
of the band or the wind ensemble. And so that's what we're doing. And the transcriber, even in, in uh, Mr. Heinsley's wonderful transcriptions, he was transcribing them for a 120-piece ensemble. And uh, in the process, we might have been doing it my, my l- later couple of years at, at Illinois. We were down to about a 56-piece wind ensemble. So really, that if I did a transcription, and uh, and I did that, I, I was I would I would try and do a little bit of editing, some fitting, thinging out, some changes, so that uh, so that it it would be greater. The how should I say? It would be better realized okay. with with our fifty six piece ensemble. The, but some pieces. You're just not going to get the textures. You're not going to get the sounds. You're not really going to come close to the composer's intent. You get the orchestra score. You get the. Uh, um, the problem most people have is they don't study the original content. They just go ahead and arbitrarily make changes. And I'm really against that. Okay. Uh, but I think it would be a shame to deprive students of. Uh, a musical experience and and uh, an experience of, uh, performing music by particularly important composers of important pieces, if they work, yeah, if they work. So to segue from that, we're this is an, another thing I was excited to talk to you about today. We're commissioning a a piece for the Joliet Band right now. I think it's our first commission since uh, March of the Steelman in the thirties, and we're starting to get sketches from the composer. And I know that you have, if I'm correct, over 30 commissioned works at least um, that you've done. Uh, I don't know if that's accurate. It might okay. be fairly close. I don't know if you would say sole commissions because we were involved in some consortium okay. projects. So, and so and so we did a, a number of those, uh, but I don't know what the number is. Okay. But it's but it's a little bit. I know something went on a, a website with that that one of my successors put in, and I appreciate that. That's very kind, but. Uh, I don't think that you you could say that. I headed okay. up some consortiums and were part of it, and and we did some commissions that I'm very proud of. Yeah, yeah. So when it comes to that, you know, my question is, how much trust do you put into um, the composer and and the person that we have is actually a a Joliet alum from the '90s that is now a, a professional Hollywood composer who's excited to kind of give back to the community and and, and do this for us. But being my first time with it, I'm getting the sketches. We're looking at it. What was your process in in the um, commissioning well, for Illinois? Well, you have to you have to know the composer, the genre that they write in, and you have to be comfortable with the genre that they write in. Uh, that you try now. They may not. It may be a comp- composer who hasn't written for band before, but some composers have written some landmark works that had never written for band yeah. before. So you can't go by that. Uh, but it's got to be a composer that you're, uh, that you are really trusting of. And you want to put, you want to put, uh, uh, how should I say, um, you, yeah, 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 you want, you want to put some guidelines on there or at least mm-hmm. some suggestions. Uh, for instance, one of the things that's just really a shame is CBDNA, for instance. Here's a, here's a situation that didn't work out very well. CBDNA, uh, put, gave a lot of money, paid a lot of money for a commission to Ernst Krennic, a very, very important, uh, uh, composer of the Weimar that had came, come out of the Weimar era in Germany and along with Kurt Weil and uh, perhaps Paul Hindemith later on and uh, and things like that and a wonderful composer and he didn't know anything about the band so somebody sent him a program of their band okay and the listing for instance they listed instrumentation and so that and this this is funny so and some of the piece it's called dream sequences uh, by Ernst Krennic. And for instance, they sent them a program of, of a band and it had, uh, uh, they had, they listed instrumentation and it said baritones. And they had four baritones in the band. And I don't know what band it was. I think it was the, uh, I think it was Bill Schaefer's band at the University of Southern California, but I, I could be wrong. 
And so they had four baritones. Well, somehow, Krennic was thinking they were talking about baritone saxes. So not only was it a section of four baritones, which usually doesn't play in any more than two parts and most mm-hmm. often is one, but he wrote four baritone saxophone parts. Wow. And that's just, that's just, an, ex- <laughs> that's just an example. And so you have to make that work. So, I mean, that happened quite often. I, I mean, that's just an example of one that didn't work yet. It was a, you know, it was a, a very important composer. And there's some other composers I can name that have written some band works that were just bombs. Some wrote band works that weren't accepted right away because it wasn't what people expected uh you know and so i mean you've got like aaron copeland's emblems which i believe was written in 1984 and they they've got copeland to agree to a commission and the commission that they really wanted was something that was like uh appalachian spring and what they got was a piece called emblems which has turned out to to be accepted over a period of time uh, uh for lack of a better term i'll call it an acquired taste but that's really insulting a piece that's truly a masterwork but because the piece as it was wasn't ex- uh, wasn't what was expected people didn't really like it at, at first and now as it turns out it's a very difficult work it's a very important piece. And Copeland was trying to reach out in terms of his own technique and in his own harmonic language. And we are very, very fortunate to have that in the, in the repertoire. But I don't think it was as accepted as it was then. And, uh, uh, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm going on and on and I don't mean to, but, uh, basically so, someone says, said one time, when you're doing a commission, when you're commissioning a piece, it pays your money and it takes your chances. But try and keep in touch with that composer. And, and what I like to say is uh, write the piece that you've always wanted to write. Most of the time uh, when you do that. Now, in the case, for instance, let's say of Cityscape that we're doing here, I asked Scott, I asked Scott to do something. I, I want something that's kind of exciting, kind of fanfare-ish, no more than about three minutes, just to sort of open the program and and uh, much like fanfares that were written, let's say, for, for the opening of uh, the Kennedy Center or for the opening of big halls or for the opening of a music festival or something like that. And so cityscape in terms of the big... Metri- there were several pieces written called Metropolis, so we weren't going to do Metropolis on that. So I asked him for that, and I got what I wanted. Uh, I had a uh, I had a piece that was commissioned by a Joliet graduate, Ron Nelson. Ron Nelson yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and Ron did a piece for us, and he had originally done the work for the orchestra for the Champaign Urbana Symphony and epiphanies and uh and he told me he was visiting campus and so i said extend a few days we'll do some of your music and he loved the the ensemble in fact we did a cd i think i think an entire cd around nelson's music and he had loved the ensemble and stuff and at the time uh he was he was coming in with epiphanies to do a rehearsal and he said man he says this would work really well for band this would be so he basically he did an adaptation and he said uh, he says you know i'd like to adapt that for band would you be comfortable for that uh, with that and he charges a very reasonable fee because he was excited about doing it and he felt like it actually worked better for that so boy we got a great piece and we got a great deal <laughs> uh and in other cases for instance we we had a piece by michael colgrass called Arctic Dreams, mm-hmm. and it was the second piece that he did for, uh, for band or wind ensemble, and he had, he had uh, his, his first piece was The Winds of Nagual, and he was very excited about it because Jack McKenzie was preparing to retire, was just about retire, to retire, and back in the 50s, Jack and, and uh, Michael both, both uh, percussionists were actually roommates. 
So uh, uh, Michael had just returned from some time on a grant from the Canadian government to go up into the Arctic, Ar- uh, the Arctic with the Inuits, and he was a very excited excited about. It. So we were very fortunate to get it. In a few cases, we got some pieces that were somewhat unfortunate, but. Uh, uh, I can't say that we ever got a, a really terrible piece out of a composer, some things that we were a little bit disappointed with. But uh, you just have to take your chances. And and the other thing is, uh, yeah, if you're doing this, I hope you have a deadline, and I hope your deadline is long before you really need it. Yeah. Because, <laughs> because very few composers meet their deadline. I mean, it just doesn't happen. And if it's in the case of a... Of, of a uh, a really fine composer and a really creative composer, it's oftentimes because they've come up with new ideas and they're going to change something and they like something else better and then they want to expand it and then they want to go from there. And you don't want to deny them a good piece. So so make sure that you don't need that piece right away. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, and accept that. And don't be uh, afraid, and I was afraid to do this, don't be afraid to ask a composer for a few changes, if that's to say, you know, that's not quite the ending we were looking for for this occasion and the type of occasion okay. on this. And or and in some cases, there may be a few sections and a mute, few things that you want to feature. Okay. Well, thank you. That helps. Yeah. Scott, I don't want to take up yeah, no, your, I, your time actually, here with your teacher. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. No, w- related question, actually. Um you talking spending time in your ensembles and your classes it comes very clear uh, your insistence on quality literature what in a general sense would you call what are we looking for in terms of quality literature for band what what constitutes that to you uh, well the old thing that you learn in in uh, in music lit class obviously themes of dominance or in the case perhaps of some form, motives of dominance, organization, uh, originality on a form, or if it's not a traditional form, at least a form that makes sense and has commitment from the composer, uh, a sense of, uh, as I say, of originality, uh, proportion, Proportion and putting it together. Balance, not from an instrumental thing, but proportion. Uh, Sensible orchestration. One of the things that bothers me a lot is some pieces these days, it seems like a lot of composers have not spent a lot of time with orchestration, for instance. And pieces where you cannot achieve the composer's harmonic intent because of the orchestration, there is no way that you can balance it. There is no way you can balance the harmonic structure from that standpoint. Something that is that has color, instrumental color, and a variety of colors. I'm looking for that, and mainly form. And something that's not trite and formulaic. Uh, one of the things in that we have in music for uh, bands and wind ensembles is formula writing. There's one particular publisher that that almost insists on it. They provide their their uh, uh, composers with almost with a template for writing those pieces, so everything comes out the same, and and that's really disturbing. And they'll call it educational music. Well, it's not educational music. It's formula music and it's right. money making music. And in many cases, uh, uh, it becomes a crutch for the band directors who uh, don't want to do a great deal of study on that. So uh, anyway, that's I, I don't want to get off on a tangent there, but, uh, uh, but anyway, that's how I feel. Uh, but the orchestrational thing is a very important part of it. Writing music that's out of people's ranges or that's impossible to balance. There was a piece, for instance, that came through that I was asked to premiere for an ABA convention a number of years ago. As it ends up, the guy who who commissioned the piece was uh, a very very fine musician himself, had hoped for something else and and when we looked at the orchestration it was almost funny. It had it 
It had trumpet way up in the upper register, supposedly playing pianissimo, uh, trying to balance with a flute in the lower register. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> and my, for instance, my wife is a harpist, and she'll get these harp parts that you know there's only two pedals on the harp and it's it's basically to uh it's basically to change keys on the harp mm -hmm. what that's for and, and then it'll be like like look at this first of all i'd need two more pedals and secondly i'd need two more feet to be able to do this so you just have to call a composer and say uh do you know what harp writing is because this is not physically possible mm -hmm. and uh so anyway and 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 uh, one young kid, a composer, who, who won a young composer's co uh, competition and, and had some potential and talent. And he said, he said, well, gee, it worked for me on the synthesizer. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you can balance anything on a synthesizer, right. you know. <laughs> right. So there, there's a lot of things. But basically in terms of musical content, uh, I get, I get a kick out of th things when somebody writes a theme and, and variations, and the theme is so bad that there's nothing you can do with it with <laughs> yeah. the variations. Right. Or what's even funnier in music education is when people pl uh, when people play uh, d try and, and and do bad concert band music on the marching band field, or they'll they'll have ar arrangements of concert band field because uh, 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 or of concert band music uh, that they'll arrange and edit the way somebody did it on on the field. Right, it, it, unbelievable. Um, so another question I wanted to ask you is, um, what do you think the role of someone in the position that you were in, director of bands at a major institution like Illinois, what do you think, what was, you, you, do you see your role being in terms of music education in a broad sense and in the wind band medium in, in general, in specifically? Well, uh, I, you know, I, I serve at a big school and doing the, the top ensemble. I have to serve a lot of functions. Uh, 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 I want music education. I want people in my ensemble to go out and teach and so hopefully when I'm rehearsing something I'm not just going back to rehearse it hopefully I, I have to try in the rehearsal process to get across the idea of why I'm rehearsing it mm -hmm. not just that I'm doing it but why I'm rehearsing it and how I'm rehearsing it secondly the music has to be music that is going to be valuable to somebody's potential professional career where something they learned in that ensemble about playing, about quality, about ensemble, about how to play in an ensemble, mm -hmm. even how to how, even how to warm up, even certain things like there's there's some people applied teachers and that may have the philosophy of well you shouldn't be doing this because if if when they're a professional orchestra they're not going to be doing that in the set well. Yeah, but they're not in a professional orchestra. They're students, and I'm trying to build them up so someday they can play in a professional orchestra, mm -hmm. and they'll understand the standards that will be expected when they play in that professional orchestra. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and so we need to do that. I need to hopefully train people what ensemble skills should be required if they play professionally mm -hmm. or if they conduct professionally, what should be expected of them in the rehearsal process. Uh, that they should be expected to, I should be expected to conduct the piece um, uh, in a competent, efficient musical manner. Uh, uh, I should be required to do that, to show them with my baton from the podium what I am expecting. Otherwise, I'm cheating them because, right. you know, the conducting process itself is nonverbal communication. Mm -hmm. The rehearsal process is about making that better and building that. And sometimes you have to teach them what the gestures are all about. Right. Although in some cases that I've observed, the gestures are all about personal choreography and have nothing to do with the music <laughs> or the people they're conducting. And you can't do anything about that. I see. I know you've done a lot of international outreach, especially when you were at Illinois. What were some of the uh, benefits for your students and, and maybe just some significant memories you have about those? Well, in tours? some cases, it was contact. Actually, some of that occurred through 
uh, purely coincidence and, uh, 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 you know, I, I, it, it just kind of happened that way. Actually, one of the most important uh, connections that we were able to make was a connection uh, through Gary Smith and the marching band in that, that Gary had such a rep- reputation that they needed somebody to do this big pageant in Singapore, for instance. And they wanted to do something like the they were hosting some sort of uh, of of uh, Pan Pacific Games, and they wanted something like is done for the opening of the Olympics. And Gary Smith was suggested, and somebody came over and observed Gary, and that, and not only uh, his wonderful uh, creative show design, but also the way he worked with people and worked with the kids. And so they invited him to go to Singapore and, and people wanted to study the marching band and, and, and he established a relationship and partnership. And then they started bringing people over to, to, uh, bands got built, uh, built there and they started bringing people over there to work with the concert band. And I was doing some conducting lessons and they were doing some things with the class. And then they, and then the Singapore Ministry of Education, uh, and had not only brought Gary over, or another organization did, but they started bringing me over. And so I trained the, in Singapore, they just have one military thing. It's just called the Singapore Armed Forces. They don't have an Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force. It's just the Singapore, uh, you know, very small armed forces. And they have, you know, there are units within there that we have separate armed forces units. And there is a, an armed forces band. And they have three bands within that. They have one that does nothing but marching and ceremonial thing. There's, they have nothing that does, uh, another band that does nothing but pops and things like that. And another band that is a serious concert band. And so I went over there for 10 days and trained and trained them and put together a concert and a couple of their directors came in and studied and we did some study and then we did a concert at the end at the Victoria Concert Hall and it was really really rewarding to work with them uh another thing that happened uh in terms of the uh the European connection was I established a relationship I was invited for instance to judge the St. Patrick's Day parade and uh and i ended it ended up with a relationship that lasted uh 21 years in ireland where i was working with the irish tourist board and i started doing workshops for the irish band directors and they had some community bands that were kind of offshoots of the british brass bands and i started working with them uh like with the dublin concert band and some things and started working with some other uh concert bands over in the uk and Dublin in the UK. Uh, the other, uh, another of the major, uh, of the major connections was done through Australia. Okay. And, uh, Harry Beejan, my predecessor, had been invited to Australia and, and had done some work there. And Russell Hammond, who's sort of the godfather of, of Australian bands, brought me over to, to do some things there. And I ended up, uh, I ended up making, uh, 13 different trips to Australia and worked with professional organizations, worked with the Australian Royal Navy Band on two occasions and uh, the semi-professional groups there and had the opportunity to conduct there. And we brought some Australian students here. And now you'll find that a lot of those Australians come over for the Midwest and some groups have even played at the Midwest. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been able to keep that, although most of my connections in Australia, uh, uh, have, <laughs> are, are has beens like me. <laughs> and so, uh, so I was brought over in, uh, either 2015 or 2016 to do what's called a BOTA, the Australian Band and Orchestra Directors Association, to do a week long, uh, uh, conducting school with them and i appreciated that and enjoyed that very much in the process though it was a great experience for me uh uh, some things that happened uh while i was over there i made very dear friends and contacts uh doing uh, uh of course doing what's called the melbourne summer camp 
and uh, summer school, which is through Melbourne Youth Music, and very much like the music camp at Illinois, ISYM, mm-hmm. and, and or Interlochen or whatever, except that it was a day camp. The kids would come in, they would, would bus in, and we'd rehearse all day, and they would have private lessons, they would have sectional, they might have an elective class like a theory, but it was an all-day thing, and I got to do that for, for six years. The only problem was their summer is our winter their summer was january Mm -hmm. so it really had to work out so i could be back for auditions and and things like that and so a few years it didn't work out but some years it did well the connection there was through bruce warland a wonderful man a dear friend of russell hammond's who is in charge of that who's sort of the godfather of uh, australian youth orchestras and who headed that up and headed up the camp and we became great, great friends. Uh, I would do a conducting thing with an elderly gentleman. At the time, I wasn't an elderly gentleman, but he was, <laughs> by the name of John Hopkins, which if somebody Googled that, you'd find out that he recorded with the, with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra when he was conductor all of the orchestral works of Percy Granger. And I got a connection to Granger, the Granger Museum, the Granger Library, and I was able to bring back some of the copies of some of the original scores that Bruce arranged for me to do, and uh, one of which was the original uh, score and sketches and handwritten parts of Lincolnshire Posey, wow. which uh, I don't think any other... Uh, anyone else in the United States has. And, and when Fred Fennell went over there, they let him uh, uh, take notes and spend a good deal of time with Lincolnshire Posey, uh, but they wouldn't let him uh, make photocopies of it. Mm. Well, I was able to do it because the, when it was moved from the Percy Granger archives to the, uh, to the uh, University of Melbourne library, the librarian had been a violinist in Bruce Warland's Melbourne Youth Symphony. <laughs> so we were able to cheat a little bit. Yeah. Anyway, that's kind of some of the connection. And with the Italian Army Band, that was through my friend Tom Fresquillo at the University of Southern uh, Mississippi, who uh, I- I introduced me to, uh, and we became good friends with Fulvio Crew who uh, is very important in the band movement in Italy and was the conductor of the Italian Army Band. So those are just some of them. And then connections through them to other people and other people and other people. It was uh, it was just very fortunate. It was it was basically it was international networking as yeah. much as anything else. Well, great. Well, we want to be sensitive to your time. Um, and I know we're kind of hitting that, that yeah. 45 minute mark there. So, um, so I guess maybe just one more question based on your, your scholarly research, your personal experience. Do you have any predictions for where music education might be going? Um, not really. You know, with most of us, with with most people of my generation and of the generation that preceded me, we tend to be gloom and doom because everybody isn't doing it the way we did it. <laughs> and one of the things I resented when I went to to uh, Illinois in '85 was this is the this is the way we've always done it, and it's always gloom and doom. But I can tell you from doing things like like. Uh, the you know the illinois all-state honor band and i work with a lot of bands in texas i work with a lot of high school bands in texas where i where i now live bands no matter what people tell you bands are better now than they've ever been okay and i just hope that with the use of technology we don't allow technology to replace bands and and win playing and uh i'm a champion for for the band I resent the fact that some people feel like there's an inferiority complex in being a band or wind ensemble conductor. It used to be that, that, that guys that were, that loved the large symphonic band were, were, how should I say, didn't, I don't want to say paranoid, but I, I, but were vehemently against going to smaller ensembles and right. were concerned that the wind ensemble repertoire would replace the man. And that hasn't happened. And some uh, some very, very good musicians have found a way to, to make that whole thing 
coexist as it well should be. I think the idea of no longer having symphonic band repertoire or even or even uh, wind ensemble repertoire and trying to go back to the days of chamber music, to go back to the days of, of harmony music and serenades, I, I, I mean, is, it's a great thing to make sure that that's included mm-hmm. in our curriculum. Mm-hmm. And when I say curriculum, you notice I didn't use the word repertoire because repertoire is our curriculum. Absolutely. But I think it's important to do that. Getting back to other things, bands play better now. The band, I'm, I'm going, and, and, and I'm, <laughs> in many cases, I'm, I'm also adjudicating, and I'll be adjudicating some terrific performances of things that I never thought high school bands would ever be, uh, be able to play, that I, that I remember were a challenge by the Illinois band. Mm-hmm. And as I say, some of the bands I work with in Texas are just phenomenal, and they're doing phenomenal performances of, of great, great repertoire. So if anybody, if anybody of my generation or, any, uh, any, or, or the generation that precedes it, that was, that was still around, to, uh, you know, tell you that the bands, of, uh, bands have all gone to hell, don't listen to them. They're better <laughs> than they've right. ever they've ever been been better than they ever uh, were. And I would hope that technology will make that even better. I know it has in terms of I know technology has been one of the greatest things that's happened to composition. Mm-hmm. For instance, you were talking about commissions. It used to be that back in the uh, back in the Late 50s, starting with Finella's recording, 60s and 70s, you know, with some of the recordings of Mr. Hinesley and stuff. It used to be that a year or two later, if there was a pretty good new work for band, unless you happened to hear it at Midwest or maybe CBDNA or something like that, you might be able to get that wonderful piece you heard and have access to it a couple of years down the road. There may even be some pieces that remain in obscurity because they didn't get the distribution. And now we have things like, for instance, you commission a piece of music. Okay, the composer does it. They do it on Finale or Sibelius or whatever. And you are able to have access to it. You get the parts much, much sooner than ever. You get the score much sooner than ever to study the score. You can take a week or two to study the score. You, then you can take uh, uh, four weeks to prepare the performance with your ensemble. Uh, you can put it out. Uh, you can send it out online. And within two months of a piece being composed, uh, every composer around the world has access to that piece and mm-hmm. can print up the parts and begin working on it. So what used to take two years is now a two-month process. And somebody can send out those pieces by obscure perform, uh, performers. Young composers, young composers with, with great talent and great potential can get their works out that they might not otherwise get out. And, and so I would hope that we will be able to use technology in that way to improve music education and, and to... Uh, uh, to, to give us access to that. So no bands aren't going to hell un, unless, unless we send them there. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, we really appreciate your time today. I, I learned a lot. I'm, I'm very grateful that you sat down with us. And uh, Scott, if you had any closing for just, Professor Keene. <laughs> just a, a thank you. A thank you for what you brought to me personally as a student. I think that makes its way, hopefully, in some f- shape or form to my students now. And just a thank you for what you've brought to the band world in general. Thanks so much for sitting down with us today. You're welcome. All the best.